All right, welcome to uh, uh, Golang UK. Um, I'm Steve. People also know me by SPF 13. I've learned that a lot of people only know me by that name. <laughs> so if you see me, that's me. Um, today, I want to talk you through where Go is. And I, I figure the best way to start is to talk about where we've been. Uh, so let's talk about some of the major milestones in the Go project. Um, First, a lot of people might not know this, that Go actually started as a 20% project at Google. Um, and Robert Griesmer, uh, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson uh, started on a whiteboard just planning it out. Um, within two years, they had something that they felt was worth sharing with the world, and they open sourced it. And that's, uh, that's the date we consider for Go's birthday, is the date it was open sourced. Um, with about five years from when they started on that whiteboard, they had reached a point where they felt it was ready for, for a 1.0 release. And that was really important because it signified a time when they thought, it's, we're done planning Go, we're done designing Go, and it's time to use Go and learn what, how, how this actually works. Because right? once you've designed something, until you've used it for a while, you don't really understand, really understand what you built. As we continue, uh, it starts progressing a little faster. In, in 2014, we had our first major Go conference. And uh, who, who was there at the first GopherCon? It's a dark room, but I only see four hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's good. Go's growing a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I remember at the time, uh, there, was a, there was a big question mark if, if Go was popular enough to sustain a conference. And, uh, and it did. And it, 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 Brian didn't uh, go bankrupt on it. Uh, which there was some worry about that. And it, it turned out to be really successful. And the first real g large gathering of gophers, um, it was great uh, to get everyone to, together in person. Uh, 2015 was a big technical milestone for the project uh, because after being bootstrapped in C, uh, we had finally made the transition to being writing Go in Go. And so now Go is written in Go, um, which makes the language actually pretty easy to a lot easier to contribute to than when it was written in C. And if you're curious about how anything works in Go, you can open up and read the source code, and it's really readable. Um, 2015 was a big milestone for a bunch of community milestones happened in 2015. Um, two of the most notable, Women Who Go and Go Bridge, were both founded in that year. Uh, we also launched the Go Code of Conduct in 2015. And for me, one of the a very personal impactful moment was Russ Cox's uh, keynote on community and open source that he gave at GopherCon. Um, it really signified that uh, this open source project was about the world. Um, in 2016, we hit another big milestone, a technical milestone, with our SSA backend, which brought uh, significant speed improvements to Go. And in 2017, uh, at, at GopherCon, at this GopherCon keynote, the one about a month ago, uh, Russ announced the intention to start working on Go2. So I want to talk some about our accomplishments from the past. Uh, this one is a, I want to tell a story about garbage collection. Uh, it is a story about garbage collection, which makes it kind of interesting. You probably have never heard a story about garbage collection before. Uh, this is one not in our own words. This is one that Brian Hatfield, uh, told, and he told it over a series of tweets over a few years. Um, there were lots of tweets in between them, so you had to really be paying attention to see this thread. But uh, what this is, is his production usage of Go. So he's running a, a production Go system. And uh, when he was running, uh, when we rolled out Go 1.5, our, our pause times decreased from 300 milliseconds down to under 100 milliseconds. Then he tweeted again for when 1.6 came out, what a significant improvement it went. It went from about 40 millisecond pauses down to under 10. With 1.7, it decreased in about half again. And with 1.8, and you've got to pay attention because the scales, if you look without seeing the scales changing, actually every chart looks the exact same. Right, that's hard to do. It's hard to make something twice or more as fast every release, uh, but, but they did. Uh, now we're at the point with Go 1.8 that garbage collection pause times on his production service uh, were under a millisecond. And we're hearing that pretty consistently across, across our user base. 
Um, so it, it garbage collection is to the point where uh, it, it's no longer prohibitive to use Go for lots of services uh, where semi-real time is needed. Um, another big accomplishment, and this one I'm, I'm particularly proud of, is that uh, in the Stack Overflow survey, Go was found as the number fifth most loved technology, but also the third most wanted. And it was the only one, it was the only technology that reached the top of both of those lists. Right? And that signifies that we, we built something that, that users really love using, and also businesses uh, and people really want to use it. Um, and as a language, a lot of our accomplishments are actually things that people are able to do with Go. And up on this side are, are, are a bunch of different open source projects that have, uh, in one way or another, really revolutionized the space that they're in. And uh, when we see projects succeed like this that are written in Go, often, I've been a part of a few of these projects, would not have been successful in another language. Uh, some of which started in another language and were rewritten into Go, and, and the success came because of that. Um, so, it, you know, for us, when we see, it's almost like uh, we get we're really proud when we see people that succeed with Go. Also, Go is known as the language for reliability, scalability, durability, simplicity, and performance. And when we, uh, whenever we talk to people about why they adopted Go, it's always two or three of these things on this list, sometimes all five of them. Um, and if you think about why you adopted Go, maybe these are some of the reasons you've, you've picked it. But it's being known for this. Uh, now I want to talk about some of our challenges from the past. I think it's really important to talk about our challenges and see uh, how we've been working on them and let, admit that we have challenges. Sometimes when we talk, we always talk about all the good things. Well, not everything's good. Um, our first challenge. Oh, yeah, I see a lot of people nodding their heads with this one. You should all probably be nodding your heads with this one. Uh, dependency management is probably our biggest challenge in Go. Um, it's something that we didn't recognize as early as we should have. And uh, we, we still don't have a good, good, good solution for it yet. Um, the user experience in Go is, for many, really challenging. Um, Ashley and I have been giving a workshop for the last few years where we teach people how to build their first Go app. And on average, it takes about 30 minutes to finish installing Go and getting GoPath for the room. Um, and that's with people TAing and helping. For some people, if without that, it takes a lot longer. It's needlessly complex. Um, community culture. This is a challenge that we, we have and share with the rest of the tech community. So I don't think we have a unique challenge in the Go community, but we still have this challenge. And it's important that we acknowledge it and address it. Um, I, I, something we do have pretty unique is our single perspective. Right? Go is developed by Google engineers who have a, a lot of experience in developing languages and running them in production. Uh, and, and Go is what it is today because of their experience that they shared and poured into that project. Um, and at the same time, that created a single perspective where we didn't acknowledge all the uses after, outside of Google enough. And uh, I think our fifth challenge is project participation. Uh, we did a survey last year, at the end of last year, where we asked people a, a, a bunch of questions. We had 3,500 responses. Uh, from that survey, people expressed over 45% of people said they really wanted to c contribute to the Go project. 45% of the people that answered that question said that. Um, but they also expressed that they were intimidated by it, and they had no really idea how to do it. They didn't feel welcome to participate. Right, so we have a lot of interest, but there's a lot of challenges to participation. So I want to talk about where Go is today. First, let's talk about worldwide adoption. So this is our Google Trends slide. And all it's showing uh, is that Go's in interest in Go is increasing rapidly over time. Uh, I joined the Go team a year ago just over a year ago, and that's about where this little tick is at the bottom here. And you can see that uh, how much we've grown since then. Interest in Go is, is over 30% more than when I joined a year ago, which is pretty phenomenal. 
Um, we're getting recognized by a lot of different media outlets. So this year, uh, in the Toyobi scale, is that how you pronounce it? I don't even know. That's what we say. Um, go go uh, reach the top 10. Uh, I think importantly on GitHub, Go is number nine by usage and the second fastest growing language, uh, which, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, we also reached the top of the IEEE rankings. And uh, on Stack Overflow, we were number 14 by usage. So Go, Go is, uh, of all these languages, one of the youngest, if not the youngest on all of them. It's pretty remarkable that it's making all these lists. Uh, and when we think about our Go worldwide usage, it's a very hard metric to track. Um, but we came up with a, a way to track it that we feel pretty good about, which is that we look at the total number of developers, and then we look at across all these different surveys and look at the Go percentages across them. And by that, we would say conservatively, we have half a million, and maybe aggressively, we have around a million users, uh, which is pretty remarkable. You know, I. If we look back a few years to when we were in that little room in, in Denver, right, we, we would not have expected that Go would have a million worldwide users in, in just a few years. Um, we have a great worldwide community. We have hundreds of Go meetups all over the world. Um, we also have Women Who Go chapters all over the world. Right now we have 20 of them. We'd love more. Um, this is a really important cause that we need to support. There's conferences all over the world as well, and in many different languages now. Um, and they've been emerging and succeeding um, pretty rapidly. Um, we're also, uh, Go adoption is really taking over a lot of different industries. So I'm going to leave this slide up for a while, but I think this is a really important slide. These are just a, a handful of the commerce and banking companies that have adopted Go. Um, and they're not just adopting Go in fringe projects, but many of them are using it as core parts of their infrastructure. Um, and you can see a lot of them have spoken about this. You can see that, that a common trend throughout all of them is they need something that works and is reliable, and so they build it in Go. And, uh, you know, if, if a bank can build their transaction uh, infrastructure in, in Go, it's probably good enough for your website or whatever else that you need to build Go with. Um, oh, also important about this is look throughout the world, right? This isn't just US companies, right? These are all over. Um, and one of the things you see Alibaba's on here, or you might see Alibaba's on here, it's like that weird face with the A around it. Um, Alibaba's average sale day is more than Amazon's highest sale day, right? So that, like when we're talking about how much transactions are going like a lot of people don't recognize how big China is but a lot of China and and uh, Asia is is betting big on go um, so we're, we're in different industries too so gaming and media has adopted go significantly and these are a bunch of different uh, companies that have adopted here I'm not going to call it all the companies because um, that would take a long time and we probably want to get to a break um, but significant companies and, you know, I think notable ones on here is Disney, uh, who does a lot of things in Go. In fact, if you've gone to a Disney website, uh, it's powered by Go. Um, if you've watched anything on Disney movies anywhere, it's powered by Go. Or if you watch a Disney movie on any streaming service, you've connected to a Go service to do that. Um, in tech... And I, I, these are a bunch of different tech companies. A lot of them have been powered by Go. Um, and I'll just leave it up there to talk for, so you can see it for a minute, because there's so much to take in. You don't need to take a picture, but if you want to, it's fine. If you do, you could tweet about it, because that would be cool. Um, I'll also put the slides up. So, um, And then in general, there's a lot of different, like this is just general companies that didn't fit in one of the other buckets. But apparently, if you want a ride-sharing service, you better build it in Go. Because not only is Uber and Lyft built in Go, but so is Grab, which is the biggest one in Singapore, I learned, which is written in Go. 
Um, a lot of different education companies, a lot of networking companies are written in Go. Fitbit uses Go in their architecture, so it's, it's definitely good for moving around in various ways. All right. <laughs> We're going to have some fun, right? Uh, and, and on this side is a bunch of uh, uh, global companies that all the other sides, they tried to put them as close as they could to where their, their headquarters are. And these companies don't really have headquarters. Right? They're, they're all over the world. And these are some of the biggest companies that have adopted Go, and they're using it as critical parts of their infrastructure. Now I want to talk about how we're addressing the challenges that we talked about earlier. So the first challenge was dependency management. What are we doing about this? Uh, first, we formed our dependency management working group. And this was a collective working group with people in the community and the Go team to try and understand this problem better. Um, the, one of the outputs of this was to create a tool called DEP, which is the official experiment. Um, and it's, it's doing well. Uh, we're learning a lot from the process of creating DEP. And what we're learning, we're, we're building into the Go tool. All right, so we have a prototype today um, internally just to test to see if these concepts and stuff would fit into a Go workflow. And we're pretty happy with the results. So um, we, we've gone to the point of not acknowledging this problem to acknowledging but not understanding this problem to I think we have a really good understanding of this problem and we're working on a solution. And uh, I know it's not soon enough, but uh, you know, nothing Go is really in the Go project. We've done all that fast. Um, but when we do it, we usually do it right. And that's our goal here, is to make sure that we, we get this right. Um, the new user experience that we talked about, what are we doing about this? Uh, first thing we did was we formed a working group, the developer experience working group, focused mostly on the new user experience. Uh, there was a bunch of different things that came out of that, um, but two of the big things that have come out of that, uh, notable about for this, is the first thing is we created user personas which we are publishing like last week, but it hasn't happened yet, so maybe this week. <laughs> um, and what this is, is uh, a lot of people don't know what we, we, when we say user personas, what that means. It means that the audience that Go has today has shifted dramatically from the one we started with seven, eight years ago. And the user personas are, are fake, real people. Uh, that have names and stories and uh, experiences, and we think of them as our audience when we're developing training content, documentation, um, and, and this is for our whole project to, to follow. Um, and the third thing, which is probably a thing you've never not heard of yet, is our one-line installer for Go, um, which has launched. So we did a soft launch on Golang Nuts because we didn't want the whole world to adopt it too quickly. But uh, from, f with this tool, you can copy and paste the line into Linux, Mac, or Windows, and run that line, and it will install and configure Go for you and set up all your paths and everything. Um, so that 30, minute, 30 to 90 minute window has gone down to 30 seconds. And uh, if you want to help us with that, please go and use it and report bugs because we're sure there's lots of bugs. Well, one thing we learned in developing this was it, when you build installers, everything's an edge case. Like there is no normal way. Um, so we found dozens of edge cases while we were prototyping and then building it out, and we're sure you'll find dozens more. Um, what are we doing to address our community culture problems? Um, the first thing we did was we, we established a code of conduct. And more importantly, we live by it and we support the code of conduct. Uh, we also support efforts like Women Who Go and Go Bridge. And this year, uh, we raised for the, these, these collective efforts, raised $42,000 for scholarship funds for, for GopherCon, uh, which was phenomenal. And it, and it made a huge difference. Um, and another thing that we're doing is we're talking more about our mistakes. Now, we've made mistakes. Um, you know, and one of our more, more recent mistakes that we made was the alias, uh, aliases in Go. And we're talking about that. And we're acknowledging what our mistakes were, and we're trying to address them and change so that we don't make these mistakes again. 
And, you know, I, 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 I remember when I wasn't on the GO team, how intimidated I was by the GO team. And I was thinking, man, these guys are perfect. They know everything. And uh, then I joined the GO team, and at our first GO summit, uh, I, I, said, I said, do you guys know what people think of you outside? And, like, none of them did. I started telling them, like, you know, I didn't think I could contribute to the project because you guys knew everything. And they all laughed. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that, like, everyone's humans. We're all trying our best and, and that we do make mistakes and we need to talk about them. Um, what are we doing to address our single perspective challenge? Uh, the first thing that I did when I joined the team was uh, start the survey. Recognize that we needed, we needed to see what our users are seeing. We need to understand what our users experience. Um, and we had 3,500 responses for a really long survey because it was the first one we ever did. Uh, we'll do it again this year. We expect we'll get more responses and it will be a lot shorter. So there's a bit of correlation to those two things. Um, we also launched experience reports. And they're a critical part of, of how we're developing Go um, from, from now on, which is if you're going to make a proposal, we really want to understand the problem that you're trying to solve. So proposals are solutions. Experience reports are issues, right? but like challenges that you're having. And uh, so we, we announced that we're this part of our workflow at GopherCon about a month ago. And since there's over 50 experience reports that have been submitted, uh, critical things that are really helping us understand where Go is struggling, things like where errors don't hold up or where the need for generics exists. Um, and, and another thing that we're doing is expanding the Go team to have more diverse viewpoints. And when I say Go team, it's a bit ambiguous. Sometimes we mean the people that work at Google. Sometimes we mean anyone who contributes to the project. Sometimes we mean uh, anyone who contributes uh, to the Go core. Um, and we're trying to expand that definition and include more people and, and, and get more participation from more companies and more individuals and uh, get more leadership in the Go project from people that, that don't work at Google. Um, and then project participation, that takes us right into that and how we're working on this. So a big part of what we've done is we're forming these working groups. Um, and we're about to announce, but I'll tell you right now, our third working group, uh, which is the community outreach working group, which we lovingly call COUG, um, because it sounds like COUG. Um, and we couldn't come up with a better one. Um, but this working group is, uh, is designed to help this worldwide growth of Go and to really help coordinate and support these efforts all over the world. Um, and so this is our third working group that we formed. And, and this model of using working groups is working really well. We intend to keep doing it to address more needs. As part of the working group model, it enables us to have leadership um, outside, of, outside of Google to participate in the project in, in leadership roles. Um, we're also, uh, at GopherCon, we did our first ever contributor workshop. And these two photos that you see here are from that workshop. If you haven't read about it, uh, go to the Golang blog and you'll see uh, we have a long blog post with lots of pictures and stuff about this workshop. But it was the first time we've ever tried anything like this. Uh, we had about 250 people uh, come and make contributions to the Go project. And, uh, and we had the, most of the Go team there and a bunch of people in, in the community come and help mentor them. And uh, it, it w went really well, far better than any of us expected. And uh, the top thing is our scoreboard that we used, which really... Uh, like, we, it, they're somewhat abstract points that people got for doing actions, but every point here corresponded directly to an action to contribute to the project. And we figured we'd have a few hundred, and we had over 2,000 points accumulate in, the, in this time period. Um, another thing that we did was we held our first ever contributor summit. And this was the first time, we, we did this also in Denver around GopherCon. It was the first time we, we ever had a meeting, an in-person meeting, with uh, the Google Go team and, all, and a bunch of community contributors uh, where we came and discussed the future of, of the Go project and how we could work better together. And it was kind of amazing to see people that have corresponded online for eight years uh, but have never met in person before get a chance to sit down and, and talk about uh, all the work that they've been doing and make connections that they hadn't before. 
Uh, it went really well, and, and our intent is to, to repeat it again next year, um, or, or regularly, and, and probably expand it a little bit more, too. Um, so I also want to talk about a few specific places where Go is really making an impact, because we talked about a lot of different companies that are using Go, um, but I want to talk about some specific experiences. So Matt from Discuss, which is like comments that go on, on the bottom of blogs and stuff, um, they were having a service that was written in another language, a dynamic language, and it kept falling over. And they thought, how, how can we make this better? Uh, let, they, they knew Go, and they, they thought it might work. And so Matt wrote a blog post about his experience, but uh, one quote from that says, in roughly a week's time, I went from initial commit to shipping replacement backends. He'd not used Go before. In a week, he was able to prototype, build, and, and de uh, deploy to production something that replaced their existing tool. Uh, I think that's just a phenomenal story, and it really talks a lot about a lot of different qualities of Go. Uh, Yandex is a big search engine out of Russia, if you're not familiar with it. And uh, they've been able to adopt Go a lot. Uh, as he says here, um, Alex from Yandex says, you can write in, Python, in Go as easily as Python, but it can save you a lot of machine resources. And this is Google translated, because he wrote it in Russian. Um, so it's pretty much what he intended to say. But I think, uh, <laughs> I think this speaks a lot about uh, what they found at Yandex was it didn't slow down their developers at all when they switched to Go. But what it did do is it freed them up to be able to do a lot more, because the machine resources weren't as taxed. And then uh, Tammy at Dropbox, uh, at, at GopherCon, she spoke about Dropbox's uses of, of Go. And a lot of people acknowledge that Dropbox is mostly a Python shop. Um, but their core infrastructure uh, is written in Go. And uh, Tammy spoke about Magic Pocket, which if you don't know, Dropbox started off on, on Amazon Web Services. S, they were like S3, huge S3 uh, storage. And when you hit certain scales, uh, the cost ratio, the cost benefit of being on Amazon, uh, it doesn't doesn't equate. And Dropbox hit that scale, and so they they about three years ago they started a project, or an idea to uh, replace the rest of their usage with something that they built in house. And uh, important for them was they wanted even higher durability than S3 guarantees. Uh, so it's nine, what is it, eleven nines, and Dropbox wanted twelve nines of durability. And so they, they did an initial prototype in a different language, and they realized it wasn't going to work. And so mid-project, they switched it to Go. And, they're, and they were able to do it uh, quickly and seamlessly and transition all of Dropbox storage onto their magic pocket. Um, and it's written in Go. And so if you think about what Dropbox is, it's, it's a storage company at its heart. And their most critical piece of their infrastructure is written in Go. Um, Tammy also told us that when they hire new, new engineers, the first thing they do is they learn Go. And they teach them Go, and they go through like a Go boot camp. So it's a really critical part of their infrastructure. Uh, so now I want to talk about where we're going and what the future for Go holds. Uh, the first thing, and you can quote me about this, because I don't think anyone's ever said this before publicly, <laughs> but Go is the language of the cloud. And if we think about it, the cloud is already written in Go. Now, when you think about the cloud, these are a lot of the technologies you're thinking about. Go is, Go is critical to building each of these technologies. So Go is already the language of cloud infrastructure. Um, what, we, what I want people to say next year is we've had great experiences with tools written in Go, and now we're ready to adopt it for our next project. Right? These tools that, they're so, uh, that have changed the way that they use the cloud have changed them. And we want people to recognize that this is going to help them as well. Go to. Clearly our future is go to. We, we've known this for a long time, but now it's like the short term future, kind of short term. Um, and I say kind of short term because when, go, when Russ announced go to, um, another conference that I'm, I'm speaking at next year, early next year, 
said, can you, can you please talk about Go too? Because it'll be out by then. No, it won't. It will not be out by early next year. I don't know when it will be out. We don't have a timetable, but it's not going to be out by early next year. Um, and really, the, the point of the announcement was to transition and to start thinking about it is really what it was. It's, we're going to start thinking about it. Um, I think there's some important things that Russ said, and I want to pull them out. He said, uh, and, and when, when we talked about this in an internal meeting a few months ago, I thought this was one of the smartest things I'd ever heard. Um, he said, actually, not this one, the next one. But this one is also important. <laughs> he said, uh, our whole goal for GoTo, it's not to reinvent the language. It's to address uh, the most significant ways Go one uh, fails to scale. And this is the one I was talking about that I thought was brilliant. Is what we're doing is uh, we're capping the number of changes we can make. And we're doing that very intentionally. We don't know what the number is. It may be two or three, but it's definitely not more than five. Right? And, and this is guaranteeing that we're not there to just clean up everything. We're not there to reinvent the language. We're there to make very surgical changes for things that uh, are the places where we fall short, shortest the most. And, um, you know, we've, we've heard of a lot of different technologies that when they come up with new versions, uh, it really challenges the community for adoption. That is, we, our goal is to not do that. Our goal is to be very methodical and strategic about what we're trying to accomplish with GoTo. Um, and I think a critical part about that is the reason we don't expect it early next year is we actually don't even know what's going into GoTo yet. We don't know what those two, three, four, or five things are. And we need your help uh, to file experience reports to help us understand them better. We understand our perspective. We understand how Go is run at Google. We don't understand how it's running or falling short in all of the places that you're using it. So help us understand that better. File experience reports. Um, we have new challenges, or, or we can call them opportunities. Uh, the first one uh, that I want to talk about is Go's messaging problem. For a long time, we've said, try it, you'll love it. That's a pretty good marketing pitch. It works really well for the early adopters. And you can tell that that's our marketing approach, because when you go to golang.org, what do you see? A giant box that lets you try it. This doesn't work very well for CIOs. They actually don't know what to do with a box like this. Um, and so we recognize that our audience is changing. Our audience has changed already. Uh, interesting thing is we, when, we, when we did the survey, when we've talked to customers, we've, we've found, and customers by customers, I mean users at, at, at companies, um, we found that people that use Go love it, but they have a hard time telling expressing why to other people. You know, and one of the challenges we have is we don't have a single great feature. All right, Go is really a collection of features that together created something great, but it's really hard to pip, pull out one individual thing and, and, and highlight that as the reason to use Go. You know, and, and, and I think uh, this is a challenge that we have to address if we want Go to get to the next place, if we really want Go's adoption to be as broad as it can be. Uh, we also have an accessibility issue. We've talked about how our audience has shifted. Our documentation has an implicit audience of a computer science educated systems programmer. And we've learned that's not our audience today, and that's definitely not our audience tomorrow. Um, and you know, the first thing we did uh, to address this was to define personas that talked about a much broader audience. Um, but that's really the first step. And there's a long road to address this and, and to make Go uh, reach where our audience already is today. And we need your help. All right, we're a very small team at Google, and there's a small number of contributors. I am constantly amazed uh, at how small our team is and how much they produce the language, a compiler, all the tooling, uh, and a runtime. It's a very small number of people. And, and all the documentation. Right, like it, it's amazing what a small group of people accomplished. But to get where we need to go, we need your help. We need our worldwide audience and their perspective to help us to, to make go what it needs to become. And that's my slides. Thank you.